Hi, this is Wayne Zell and welcome to Blueprint for Wealth. Today, my special guest on Blueprint for Wealth is my friend and, and uh, client and, and confidant, Bob Margolis. Welcome, Bob. Thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for inviting me. A real pleasure to be here. Excellent. And let me give you a little bit of background on Bob and the company that he operates, TM Associates. TM Associates is an interesting company. It uh, has been around for many years. Um, they basically ensure every opportunity to maximize a community's value and profitability. Since 1978, the company has been around that and has earned a reputation for diligence, dedication, and service throughout the Mid-Atlantic region and beyond, basically helping countless apartment communities, developing them, managing them, and meeting the highest expectations of their tenants and other owners that are involved. TM, Man TM Associates has a management side and a development side, which we'll talk about with Bob today. He's gonna to tell us a little bit about the origins of TM, how they've grown so radically over the last 30, 40 years, and the challenges that he faces today. So Bob, first, give us a little bit of background. I, I know TM stands for Tevis Margolis, your dad, who may he rest in peace, um, tell us a little bit about how he started into this and how you got involved into it. Sure. Well, you know, my dad uh, grew up poor and he was in the Navy and he was a basketball player. And uh, afterwards, uh, he met my mother and uh, they got married and moved to Washington and he had several careers. He was a home improvement guy was really his primary career. You know, he'd call get some guy up and say, I hear your roof needs fixing, and then he'd find a, a roofer to fix it. And uh, Bud Fuller Brush, you know, quite a promoter. He's always been a promoter. And then he saw my mother's brother, my uncle, making some money uh, and said, I, if he can do it, I can do it. And he went in on this land deal uh, back in uh, 1968. And then he... he uh, he got into the affordable housing business and actually in 1968 started his building his first affordable housing job, which is a HUD development in Winchester, Winchester Gardens. So that was the first affordable housing development. So ever since then, over 95% of what we do is affordable housing and uh, very low income. So how have you grown it? Tell us where you are today and how, what is the secret to the growth that you've generated in? Uh... Sure. Uh, well, just I wanted to say I, I'm, I am extremely fortunate. I've had a blessed career. I've grown up in this business from middle school, working in the summers, uh, being with my dad. And then I went two or three weeks after college, started full time. I'm in my 38th year in the same job. It's really the only job I've had outside of uh, college. And uh, my dad had 38 developments uh, that he had with different partners. Uh, he didn't manage anything. He was just a partial owner of 38 developments. And today we're over 300 developments. Uh, but it was one deal at a time. We lived deal to deal. Uh, we were bottom feeders, meaning, you know, I couldn't compete with any of the big boys. I didn't have any big money. So I went to the most rural areas and uh, where uh, USDA money was available, did the small deals that nobody else wanted to do. But I was so lucky because uh, I had so much fun going to these rural areas and meeting people. And also I had an airplane and I would fly to these remote locations and even bike down to my meetings. Is that right? Yeah, really uh, had the ultimate career. Did you jump out of any helicopters? Because I know that's something that you've done before. Right. No, not, not when I was working. Just, <laughs> that's just for fun. Just crashed my airplane once. Oh, God. So... So the, uh, the current state of the management side of the business, where you manage properties all across the Mid-Atlantic region and it's expanding, um, how many units are you managing today at TM Associates? Yeah, we're managing just under 14,000 apartments. Wow. And, and are, of those apartments, do you own a significant number of those? About 10,000 out of the 14,000 at the moment. So that number compared to what you what you your dad started with back in 1968 is you know it's just dramatic growth what do you attribute the growth to over the last 30 years really well you know we just kept getting better at what we did and then the tax credit program was an enormous break for us uh, 
and uh, I was always rural until I slowly built up and was able to come back home. I was able to come and do suburban, and now I'm doing urban deals in downtown Washington. Uh, so it was just it was learning and growing up in the business and gaining capital and you know paying off your debts and working to the next deal and and just keep just growing. A lot of, so the, exactly. so the tax credit deals that you're referring to are the low income housing tax credit, which uh, really was initiated back in 1986 when I started practicing law. The largest source of affordable housing in the United States is funded by these deals. Are all your deals tax credit deals? Uh, just about, you know, there's four types of affordable housing. Uh, you know, there's naturally occurring affordable housing. There's HUD developments and USDA developments and state developments and tax credit only developments. Uh, then HUD has nonprofit programs, but 90% of all new affordable housing is tax credit today. And so you've been able to take advantage of that program and use it to your advantage to grow the company significantly. Tell us a little bit about some of the urban deals you're doing. I know you're, um, you're working in Washington, DC. Those are some recent, uh, uh, deals that you've begun developing. I know it's a challenge to do business in the district. Um, wh what's going on downtown? I'm proud to say we're doing the finest affordable housing in Washington, D.C. today. Uh, at 1550 First Street Southwest, we just built an 11-story tower, 76 apartments. Wow. It's all 100% affordable, but 20% is for homeless. Is that right? Yeah, and then we're building a second tower next to it, 101 units, and it'll be the prettiest thing uh, Washington's ever seen in affordable housing. It'll be a total of 178 units, and approximately about 15% of that one's going to be for homeless. 15%, uh, 20%, that's significant. Um, does do you, do you think that you're going to be able to lease up the, you know, the rest of it with uh, people that can afford to pay the rents? Oh, yeah, there's just a tremendous demand, and this is an incredible location right by, right in between the baseball and soccer stadiums, and less than, there's going to be a sports betting casino less than a block away. Well, yeehaw. It's a very exciting area. Yes, it is, it, it's an incredible growth area, and I, I just thought it would be great to talk a little bit about that. Um, Bob's done so well that he was recently awarded the, the Council on Affordable R and Rural Housing member of the year award uh for 2022 tell us a little bit about the, that council and you know what what the council tries to achieve and what that award means to you sure well i started out in the business doing uh, u.s department of agriculture section 515 properties which is rural rental housing you think of hud and housing and urban development what well, usda does rural rental housing they have 14 or 17,000 developments across the country, about 420,000 apartments. And so uh, that's how I started the business. I'm the fifth largest owner of that type of housing. Wow. And, and so that's our association that represents us. It doesn't just represent us for the 515s anymore, but for any tax credit, rural affordable housing. Well, congratulations. So it's, quite, it's quite an honor to get. Thank yeah, you so much. Congratulations. That's a, a fantastic award to win. You know, I know we have, that, a huge, we have a huge college scholarship and uh, it's very gratifying. I know that you've experienced some challenges over the years in trying to grow the business and, you know, make it work for the people that work for you, but also the people that, uh, you know, that have been helping you along the way. What are the challenges that you found were the greatest challenges that you had to overcome and how did you achieve that? How, what were the how what were the ways that you were able to get over those challenges? So tell us first about some of the challenges you faced as an entrepreneur in building this uh, this affordable housing business. Yeah, sure. Well, first in the early days, I had to compete in several states because you know my chances of losing was great. So I would win one out of three, one out of four. So lucky to be in maryland you think about all the little state capitals and they're all in driving distance it's much different out west sure and so that was the first that, until i was able to build up a certain base but then another interesting towards the early middle part of my career another very interesting thing happened all these deals these rural rental deals uh, were built in the 70s and 80s 
and some of them are going downhill by the mid 90s and none of them had ever been renovated well i got into the first game of, of uh, buying some cheap and renovating them and there's a time span before you're able to renovate them and all of, the government didn't recognize me as a good guy coming in to fix things but all of a sudden i was the bad guy that let the place go down and uh so doing the first rehabs uh, was very challenging and getting the government to change their standards and procedures for a white knight, so to speak. How did you do and that? Was, How did you overcome the right. government? Well, it got really bad. I mean, then right around 2002, I had four lawsuits against the government. They were trying to put me out of business. Okay. And guess what? I was successful on all four. And that's and, excellent. Uh, it was an enormous challenge to overcome. It was very depressing because I knew I was doing the right thing, but you know, it, I was the bad guy because they didn't they didn't have people like me to come in and fix situations. Yeah, because you were renovating dilapidated properties or properties that had become dilapidated over time. Right. I was getting rid of problems for the government and helping residents find better, affordable, safe, and decent housing. Exactly. Exactly. Aside from the uh, the government, were there any other challenges that you faced in growing this business? People, I you think know, there's be. always the per there's always the personnel challenges, yeah. and and people have their time, and uh, I've got no regrets on on the way things have happened. But there's changes in leadership, and there's a lot of human resource issues. And there was one year the government tried to shut us down for fraud, waste, and abuse in my insurance program, and we were victorious. But, you know, you just take what comes, I guess. You know, I like your attitude. It's very, uh, you know, easygoing. You don't get uh, uh, upset or emotional about it. You just deal with it, right? And I think that's the it's, right way. Business. So as a, as a advice to a, uh, to a young entrepreneur, if you had to give advice to a young entrepreneur who wants to get into the housing game, what would that advice be? How can they well, do it? Affordable housing is such a double bonus. It's a good way to make money and you're doing good at the same time. There's just no better business. And it's about to be opened up and increased by 50% by the government. How? It, so it's just a great thing to get into and I high, highly encourage anybody. But for success, it takes a lot of hard work for a long time, putting forth your best efforts at a certain point the secret to success is finding younger people that do it better than you. And so uh, delegation, organization, picking the right people and uh, bigger and better. And just you keep going at it. You can't be too careful sometimes. The great thing about affordable housing is everyone's rooting for you. Everyone wants to make the deal happen. And uh, it's not that way in the conventional world. I noticed, so, I noticed that you have a very diverse and inclusive uh, management team on the management side of the house. It's really very intriguing to me to, uh, to see the people that are surrounding you, helping you grow and manage all the properties that you've got. It, you have over 450 employees, don't you, today? I have almost 600 employees. 600 yeah. employees. And so, you know, you're, you're providing not only housing for people that can't afford it generally but you're also providing jobs and job sustenance for people in those communities which is a beautiful thing is it hard finding good people to help run these projects uh it's always hard there's always a lot of turnover we've gotten a lot better you know there was a time we were having 20 percent turnover in management uh COVID's actually helped us uh, and also I want to have the best companies. So I'm very in a fortunate position. I have a development and a management company and my profitability is not my number one incentive in those companies. My incentive is to have the best companies and do the best I can for my employees and my tenants. And that's because truthfully, because I own so much, the properties take care of my ownership and that's what I really care about. So it's wonderful that I can just try to have the best company and not try to hold anything back. So we do training, we do 401k, we have a healthcare plan. We have uh, an intranet with TM University and, and we, we have a real, a, a personal touch between employees. We have uh, retreats and training, you know, so 
people love working for me. I'm very fortunate. I think and you're a good boss. I think that's also it's interesting that the average age is in the early 50s. My employees, uh, they're females. The managers are all, almost all females. The maintenance are almost all males. Interesting. So we, have, we have trainings of all, either all females or all males. It's kind of fun. That's excellent. Well, you know, we've been talking with Bob Margolis, who is the CEO and owner of TM Associates. They do management and development of affordable and rural housing. And uh, we're very fortunate to have you as a guest today because your business is very unique and there aren't a lot of people that do this well. And you're uh, having been recognized for the CARH member of the year. Congratulations on that. Congratulations on your success. And thank you so much for being a special guest on Blueprint for Wealth. Thank you so much, man. It's a real honor. And uh, stay tuned for a special educational moment. We're going to actually talk a little bit about the low income housing tax credit, what it is, how it works. And if you are interested in doing affordable housing, how you can get into that market. Thanks a lot. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Wayne Zell, and welcome back to Blueprint for Wealth. Today I'm talking about on our educational moment. The low income housing credit, why it means something, how it works, and how it might affect you as an investor. Today, we're just going to briefly discuss what the low income housing tax credit is, how to qualify it for it, how to calculate it, how to allocate it, and what the costs and benefits of it are. The LIHTC, low income housing tax credit, was initially enacted in 1986 to provide tax incentives to construct or rehabilitate affordable rental housing for low-income households. It has supported the acquisition, construction, or rehabilitation of over 2 million units since 1986. Basically, the federal government issues tax credits to the states and the territorial governments. And then the state housing agencies in each state award the credits to pro private developers of affordable rental housing through a competitive bidding process. The developers usually sell the credits to private investors so that they can get funding to help build the projects. Once the housing project is placed in service, in other words, when the tenants occupy the units, investors can start claiming the benefits of the low income housing tax credit over a 10 year period. Many types of rental properties qualify for the credit, including not only apartment buildings, but single family homes, townhouses, and duplexes. In order to qualify, two tests must be met. The first known as the income test can be satisfied in basically three ways. First, you can get the credit if at least 20% of the project's units are occupied by tenants who have an income level of 50% or less of the area median income adjusted by family size. That's known as the AMI. Or you can qualify if at least 40% of the units are occupied by tenants with an income of 60% or less of AMI or at least 40% of the units are occupied by tenants with income averaging no more than 60% of AMI, and none of the units are occupied by tenants whose income is greater than 80% of the AMI. The second test is known as the gross rent test. And in that particular test, the rents being charged to the tenants cannot exceed 30% of between 50 or 60% of the area median income, depending on the share of the tax credit rental units in the project. All of these projects must continue to comply with the income and rent tests for at least 15 years, or the credits are recaptured dollar for dollar. In addition, there's an extended compliance period after that totally 30 years generally imposed on these projects. Basically, the annual credit is a percentage multiplied by the project's qualified basis. The percentage varies 
depending on whether it's new construction or substantial rehabilitation versus projects that might be rehabs or funded with tax-exempt bonds. Qualified basis refers to the portion of the housing project that is rented to tenants who meet the income tests. The Low Income Housing Tax Credit Statute basically specified that the IRS would periodically reset the credit percentage to maintain the present value of a 10-year stream of tax credits at either 70% or 30% of the project's qualified tax basis. But because interest rates have been so low, the present value of credits actually has exceeded 70% of the qualified basis for many of the projects. In 2022, each state is allocated the greater of $2.975 million or $2.60 per person. That's dropped a little bit from 2018, but it's still pretty significant for states with large populations. The states then allocate these, these credits to the developers based on whatever the state's allocation plans are for low-income housing. Projects that are financed by tax-exempt private activity bonds don't meet, need to obtain a separate credit allocation from the state housing finance authority, but the state still has to approve of the use of the bonds, so it's still regulated at the state level. The developers then turn around, syndicate these projects, and sell the credits to investors who may be able to use the tax credits better. Oftentimes, these credits are sold to large corporations. They may be sold to uh, financial institutions who can utilize the credits. Most investors in, long, in low income housing tax credit projects are corporations and financial institutions, but many are sold to very wealthy, high income taxpayers. Are the benefits worth the cost of the credit? Well, the credit costs the federal government upwards of $10 billion a year. And the arguments in favor of the credit is that it's a good program for es essentially increasing the amount of affordable housing stock over the period that it's been in effect. It also addresses a major failure in our marketplace, the lack of quality affordable housing and efficiencies can arise from using private sector business incentives to develop and manage and maintain affordable housing. But there are arguments against this. In other words, is the federal subsidy overinflated because you're not only providing low-income housing, but you're helping the organizers, the syndicators, the developers of these projects, and the managers and the investors, all of these people benefit is it really worth the cost? So a significant portion of the subsidy doesn't go into the creation of new rental housing stock. It may go into the pockets of the investors or the syndicators. In another criticism, many people say that the statute and the regulations are extremely complex to the point of being overly complex. And state housing finance authorities often approve of low-income housing tax credit projects in ways that concentrate the development in existing low-income communities. So you're basically propagating the poverty that exists in those areas by just building more housing in those areas. Why not build it in more affluent areas? So that's a little bit about the low-income housing credit. And it definitely can help you lower your income tax liability. If you'd like to find out more ways of minimizing your income tax liability, give us a call at 571-203-9355 or visit us on the web at zelllaw.com. I'm Wayne Zell and thank you for listening to Blueprint for Wealth and our educational moment designed to help you realize your personal dreams of wealth and freedom. Have a great week. Thank you.